He came fulfilling the promise of God. His royal birthright can be traced down from the book of Matthew in chapter 1, from Abraham to Joseph, the husband of the Virgin Mary. I'm, I'm laughing at this part where I said husband of Virgin Mary because it wasn't until just right there in that seat. I've had this lesson all week that I was taught that I said the wife. He was the wife of the Virgin Mary. I was like, that's wrong, Johnny. That's not right. So he is the husband of the Virgin Mary, Joseph. Um, it is through Joseph who uh, adopted Christ as his own. We know that from last week. We spoke of that. Um, that we trace the promised world line of Christ. That's where we get that at. Um, in prophecy, we found that Jesus to be the same as he is, who is the son of man, who we um, seen in Daniel described and prophesied about. For if you remember the scripture, he, uh, Daniel said, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the son of man. This is talking about Christ, Jesus. Came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the ancient of days, the ancient of days would be uh, talking about God, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion, glory, and a kingdom. And all the peoples and nations and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. So see here we're seeing uh, prophecy right here. Uh, which shall not pass away in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. That's in Daniel 7. So as we, ask, as we open the New Testament, we find Jesus, the Son of Man. Preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. So if he's preaching the kingdom of God is at hand, we know that in Daniel they prophesied, he prophesied that his kingdom was coming. Does this imply that his that Christ's kingdom already came and gone? In short, the kingdom is both present and future. And it's going to take us a whole lesson to answer this in detail. Because I want us to understand exactly what Jesus' kingdom was and is. I want us to understand this and why we need to go through this because there's some scriptures in here and some translations that has confused so many people that they do not believe in his soon coming kingdom. And we want to go through that. So we want to um, get the answers from um, God's truth in his word. So he is present. His kingdom is present. At the moment of Jesus' divine and supernatural conception, the kingdom became physically um, present with man. Um, wherever the kingdom is, there is a king, and wherever the king is, there is a kingdom. Um, the moment Jesus was born, the king of that everlasting kingdom began to dwell with man in flesh. So Jesus was flesh and as much as God. Matthew 2.2 2 says, we read of the wise men who ask, where is he who was born a king? Jesus was born a king. He, he is the promised king. He's the one that is prophesied about. So uh, Christ taught and proclaimed of the kingdom of God. Therefore, we see the kingdom of God present in his ministry. Now, I want to talk about the term son of God and son of man. I want us to look at this for a little bit. When Jesus first came to us, he came as the son of man. Now, son of man here is a Hebraic meaning. It is a term simply meaning human being. But it's also a double meaning because meaning he is human, human also means that he is the exalted heavenly one. Because we read about that in Daniel. He's the prophesied one, um, Rick, that we talk about. Um, in Luke 1.35, it says, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing, meaning that holy one, talking about Christ, which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So here, he is referred to as the Son of God, but Christ um, is also, he refers to himself as the Son of Man, excuse me. So Jesus was born to us human, yet he's fully God in the flesh. Um, he seldom referred to himself as the Son of God, but he more often spoke of himself as the Son of Man. So what, what reason is that for? There's a couple of reasons that he chose to speak of himself as a son of man. Now, he did speak of himself as a son.
They were ready to pounce on him all the time. If he suggested he was the son of God and their scriptures showing <clears throat> that, they were ready to arrest him. So saying son of man, he wasn't denying that he was the son of God. But saying son of man just helped protect his ministry. There's a lot of wisdom and discernment. Um, so son of man allowed him to continue his ministry without constant interference. He had a mission. Why he was not? He had a ministry. Um, and we'll understand this as we go on. So he is full of discernment and wisdom. Um, if you remember the scripture where uh, Christ taught on the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 7, 6, he says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample under uh, their feet, and turn again to rend you. So here, um, at this part of the sermon, uh, Christ had been talking about judgment. And was he under a lot of judgment? of the scribes. He was nitpicking everything. They didn't take him for being the son of God or the son of man that who was prophesied and promised in the, in the very word that they studied. If we remember uh, Matthew 10, 14, it's basically saying the same thing. I forgot Mark was in the house. I, uh, but, um, Matthew 10, 14 says, um, Christ says, if anyone not receive you, what were they to do? Shake the dust off their feet. They were, they were to go on their way. This scripture was saying the same thing. And uh, so this is not to say that we are to refrain from preaching, refrain from teaching, or even spreading the gospel. However, there's supposed to be wisdom and discernment that's warranted when following, falling on those righteousnesses. I know. However, wisdom and discernment is warranted when... God's word is being presented to those with a purposeful heart and intent to dismantle his work. So there's people that, that you will present the gospel to that they don't want to hear it. That their intent is to destroy and divide the word of God. And I want to take this opportunity to answer a class question. A couple weeks ago I sent out um, little note cards and asked you to ask any questions you wanted towards the end times or whatever. And one of the questions, and this fit perfectly here in the lesson, was how do you tell when someone won't listen? I'm assuming that this is asking how do we witness to those who have a deaf ear or a hard heart against the word of God? Well, first you've got to understand they have a hard heart. And are we to give up on them? No. But if they're not listening, this is the best advice that I can give you, and also it's in the word. But you know where it says actions speak? Louder than words, we should live that walk right before them. And more importantly, we should pray and pray in faith and um, trust in God. Live that walk before them. Uh, fervently pray, not just half hearted prayers. And we should go in fasting. That word, he wants to listen to the word, I'm telling you. It's a little nuts over here. Okay, so we're talking about the Son of Man versus the Son of God, why Jesus spoke to himself that way. So the first one was he needed discernment and wisdom. The second, the Son of Man connects him to Daniel's prophecy. In responding to the high priest during his trial, Jesus says he declares himself as the Son of Man, the one who would come on the clouds. This was prophesied in Daniel. Mark 14, 61 says, But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ? The son of the blessed, and Jesus said, I am, and ye shall see the son of man sitting on the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So here Christ was even talking about his kingdom in future tense, and Christ was there. Christ was presenting the kingdom, but he's also talking about his kingdom coming. We're going to have to remember this verse as we dive in a little bit. Further. So Jesus clearly declared his identity and who he was. He didn't back away from it. He did talk about how he was son of God and how he was a son of man and how that connects. So Christ came preaching the son of God is a man. We've already established that Christ came as a representative of the soon coming kingdom. He was born to us, the promised and uh, prophesied um, king. So is the kingdom of God within us? is the kingdom of God within our hearts and in our minds. I want to go through this because this is an important question where so many get tripped off on this one verse that I'm getting ready to read you. And um, they believe that God's kingdom, so many believe that God's kingdom is a fabrication 
sad. That's it. They're missing the scripture. And I don't understand why they think that because there's so much scripture that clearly states his promise, how his, his kingdom is prophesied, he promised to us. So within us is his kingdom within us. Luke 17, 20 says this. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, talking about Pharisees demanding of Christ, when is the kingdom, when is it going to come? When is the kingdom of God, God coming? And he answered them, and this is what Christ replied. The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. This within you.
That makes us kingdom heirs, and that sets us in line to receive the internal kingdom of God. That's what that does. So as kingdom people, we can taste and we can experience, as Hebrews 6, 4 states, the powers of the world to come. We get to experience, we get to taste a little bit of that kingdom while here on earth because he reigns in our hearts. So God, in God's kingdom, what do we find? We find the glory of God. We talked about that in the previous studies. We find his glory. We find his joy. We find his peace. We also find fellowship with the saints. So although his eternal kingdom has not yet come, but it will, we still get to taste and experience that also here on earth. We have fellowship with one another. We can have joy through tribulation. We can have peace. So we have, have him in our hearts. How about in our minds? Is his kingdom in our mind? Well, he said that we're supposed to be, it's supposed to be on our minds. Uh, Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be under, uh, unto you. Um, to seek something means you really have to search it out. One of my pet peeves is when growing up, my kids and my husband would say, if you want to find something, just make mom mad and she'll find it. Mm -hmm. Well, what it is, where's your mom getting mad? Honey, have you seen my belt? Mom, have you seen my shoes? Mom, have you seen my favorite shirt? What well, did you look here? Yes. Well, they stood and they opened and that's all they did. Mm -hmm. They did not search because I said, well, if you dig down, and maybe get on your knees and look where I told you you might see them, you know. Is that right? Can, I, can you amen me over there, daughter? Not me. Okay, okay, I forgot. All right. Not right. So, God says, you got to seek you first the kingdom of God. He is always supposed to be on our mind. We're supposed to seek his kingdom through his word, through prayer. We're always supposed to be looking up, aren't we? So, his kingdom is present, but his kingdom is also future. We open this lesson with the question, has the kingdom come and already gone? Well, let's think about what we learned so far. The kingdom of God became present in the person and ministry of Jesus Christ. As our king, he reigns in our hearts. The promised and prophesied kingdom of God is a literal kingdom and not a fabrication of our minds. It's not something superficial. Um, it doesn't only live inside us, but a kingdom that will endure for all eternity. It's, some, it's heaven that is promised to us. So let's connect. So we, we have the kingdom present. We have the kingdom coming in future. And then we have the kingdom and the cross. How does the cross have anything to do with us receiving the kingdom? And a perfect time since Easter is just next week, right? It's a perfect time to uh, weave this in. So we know that God's kingdom was present in person and ministry. So now we're going to connect the kingdom and the cross. Why did Jesus come as a baby? Why did he come to us as a baby opposed to just skipping all that and riding, coming on the clouds to take us home? Why did he come as a baby? Well, there was a necessity for a sinless representative. We had to have a sinless representative. Christ was born. He was a sinless man. He never, ever sinned. He was holy. A representative is needed so all will come to the knowledge of the truth of his word. God will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of truth, 1 Timothy. So Christ came to bridge the gap between us and God. Uh, Christ is our mediator. Uh, for there is one God, one mediator between God and men, that man, that the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So the cross was not a hurdle to be jumped. It, was, it wasn't an obstacle. It's not an obstacle, but it was an open door. So we have to have the cross. We have to realize that the cross was an open door for you and I to enter that kingdom. It was and it is an essential part of entering the kingdom of God, which was and is to come. For all who would accept this invitation.
snake, God presented the good news to Satan that he was going to lose this battle. He said, you lose. Genesis 3.15. And I, now I want to go through this scripture. I want, to, I want us to understand what this scripture really means. Because on the surface, we think that God is just cursing the snake and there's something there about the snake and women and all this. I want, to, I want us to understand this first. This is a very important, important scripture. Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his hill. Now first, enmity is a deep-rooted hatred. And he says, God says, I will put a deep-rooted hatred between thee, talking about Satan, and the woman. Now, Christ is not a woman that is talking about Eve and her seed, which down the line ends up being um, a descendant. Christ is a descendant of Eve. And between your seed and her seed. So, Christ, God, or God is saying, I'm going to put hatred between Christ and Satan, between the seed of Satan, and between the seed of Christ, which is us, the church. It says, I'm going to put that hatred between you. And it says, it, actually translated as in he, Christ, shall bruise your head, and thou, talking about Satan, shall bruise his heel. Satan can only bruise Satan's, or Christ's heel, meaning that he can only put suffering on him. He can't do no more to Christ than that and cause him suffering. But we see that Christ is going to also cut off the snake's head. You see that in the end, that that's going to happen. Am I, and is this too deep for you guys? Are y'all getting this pretty good? This is okay. Okay. In conclusion, when Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God's hand, he had not yet came on the clouds of heaven, as prophesied in Daniel. He will fulfill that part um, in God's appointed time. The kingdom of God was present first in the ministry of Jesus Christ, who reigns in our hearts for those who have received. His invitation. Christ preached the kingdom of God is at hand. His invitation. So when he was here on earth, when um, he came and he presented and he said, my kingdom is at hand, he's saying, now I, I'm the access that you have to God. This is your invitation that you can enter into the kingdom of God. So you have to come through me before you can get to God. And that's what he's saying. Philippians 3.20 says, for our conversation is in heaven. Conversation here is actually translated citizenship. We have a citizenship. So for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So who are those citizens? I like this answer. A community of ransomed people who live under the reign of God. Isn't that a beautiful term right there? We have been ransomed. And we live under God's reign. Jesus firmly stated in Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So Jesus is firmly stating that his um, kingdom is prepared to receive citizenship. The door is open and we can enter as long as we do some um, fundamental conditions. We come in and believe. Confess our sins, and we walk in obedience to Him. I, I like this lesson. I thought this was good. It's very deep. It was a very deep lesson. I thought. I think it's necessary. I think it's necessary when we serve Christ and those come to us with questions that we have an answer. I think we need to give them an answer. Why? Why did He come? Why did He not just come on the clouds? Why was He born to us? Why was the cross necessary? What is the kingdom about? And that's what this lesson was about. This is a little deeper than what we normally go, but I think it was a good lesson that God gave us, and I enjoyed it myself. Um, I think from the heart of things, um, for like a young child, but I don't know when Grant Bale had a three day Justin class. Mm -hmm. And I wish I could do more with him now, you know, to explain stuff. But, I mean, she had to explain to us. 
the Holy Spirit. Yeah. How do you get that to make sense? And I came across this term that I've used from a long time ago in my ministry, and I still use it even as on adults. But you take an ice cube, there's one form, then you take water, and you take steam. They're all separate in, in their state, but they're all the same source. And that's a good way to explain the Trinity like that, especially if you're talking to your child. But it works just as well for me because I've got childlike brain a lot of times. So. Trying to dig and understand some of these uh, other things sometimes is hard to understand and try to get out. So I hope I don't wear you out with some of this, but I try to repeat so that it gets in here and here and here, that we can understand why, why we believe what we believe. I think that's important. 